Okay, well, let's start. Uh, so, you know, I was thinking about the seminar, which has been going on since today's speaker was a PhD student here, and we used to be a uh, floor downstairs. The seminar started in such a good way, which is just people showing up and talking about what they were stuck on in their research. Discussion for you on and on. It's really great. So great to have you back. Uh, welcome to today's CDAR seminar. I'm Lisa Goldberg, one of CDAR's co directors, and it is my extreme pleasure to introduce Marcus Pelger, a Berkeley alum, Stanford professor, and apparently talking about one of my very, very, very favorite topics, which is shrinkage. <laughs> uh, but yeah. I haven't shrunk term structures yet, so I'm excited right. to hear how, uh, how that works. All right. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to come back, right? As you mentioned, it's emotional for me to be back here because I have spent a lot of time here. And I would say, you know, we started the seminar series as a PhD student or a research update type seminar, right? Right. So <clears throat> it's nice to come back and, and talk with you and present what I'm doing here. So this is joint work with Damir Kolikovic, who is in the Science Institute, and my former PhD student, Ye Ye, also from Stanford. And this is about the term structure. So what we want to do is we want to understand and price the term structure. So a quick recap, when we talk about term structure, we mean what is the price and return of, um, of uh, securities that have different maturities when they pay off. So what I really want to be able to do is to understand the prices and returns of discount bonds for all possible maturities. The discount bond pays one dollar one year from now, or two years, or three years, etc. And I want to be if I have a good asset pricing model for all discount bond returns, then I can price the return of any default prefix income plan because these are like basis assets. Now, more specifically, I want to get a factor model for the complete full panel of discount bond returns. Now, why is that challenging? Well, I do not observe these basis assets. What I do observe are treasury bonds, which are typically coupon bonds. And I only observe them for a relatively sparse set of maturities and observe them with noise. So what I observe is a very small number of prices and returns. And I want to infer from this a discount bond curve and a model to price this curve. Well, why noisy prices? I mean, this is one of the most big red market in the world, right? Well, let's talk about it. Um, you can, there are a number of arguments why you might observe price deviations. Um, and some of them might be related to liquidity issues because not every maturity might have the same uh, liquidity. Um, you might also argue that there are certain market imperfections that play a role, but you can observe securities with very, very close um, maturities, but the prices deviate. And then you see very soon the next day the prices adjust. So there seem to be some form of market imperfection empirically. Now we will talk about what is a good model and how do I define good here, right? So uh, there will be a number of things, but essentially I want to know what is a good model out of sample. And then to some degree, then if there wouldn't be any imperfections in my model should be good out of sample. If I have a discrepancy between what I fit in sample and out of sample, then there is something that I can, could call noise. Um, but let's come back to this later on. Now, what we do is... Can I ask you up front yeah. question too? This is all treasury bonds, no credit. Mm -hmm. I will only talk about the treasury market today. I will tell you how what we do can be used as an input for uh, credit bonds as well, because there you also have a term structure. Mm -hmm. But in addition, you have uh, credits, you have credit risk, right? That comes on yeah. top of it. But let me talk about a problem that looks simpler, but actually is not that easy. And there are, in my opinion, very interesting insights to be learned. So um, if I <clears throat> if I can just comment. Yeah, you uh, define non chronological curve okay. estimation as factor model. No, so no. let me just come back to it. So whenever, when you look at the literature, how do the people build asset pricing models for the treasury market? First, you estimate in one form or the other, either prices, yields, or returns of discount bonds. For example, you have a parametric model, and that's Spencer Siegel, et cetera. Given that estimated, I call it curve, because you estimated discount bond for a lot of maturities. Given this curve, you then estimate in the second stage some kind of asset pricing model, which could be a factor model. First point is, if your estimate of discount bond returns is imprecise, 
that anything that you do later will be biased and contaminated. And what we show you is that a lot of the discount curves that people use so far are very biased, noisy, and actually will omit information that's relevant for asset classing. Second thing why it's important to think about it as a joint problem is because we can actually learn why we get certain factors. So the reason why there's a specific structure in the discount points depends on how the estimation of the curve after the first case. Just to be more precise, there is an equivalence. So the reason why you get factors for discount bonds is because you can approximate the discount curve with a sparse set of basis functions. That's an equivalence that you can show. But once you understand why you get certain shapes in the curve, you understand why certain factors arise. And it helps you even to explain what they're doing. Now, as I said before, the problem is fundamentally estimating a curve. That is a high it's a complicated problem. You know, function estimation um, is, is a non parametric problem. What we provide is a novel method, which is actually, in my opinion, amazing. We show that this problem can be solved with a simple regression. Now, why is that relevant? The moment you have a regression, things become linear. When things become linear, it maps into tradable portfolios, and it very naturally maps into a factor modeling setup. So we are showing that we have a method that is very precise to get discount bond returns. Um, it gives us tradable returns, and we have a publicly available data set for this. And given the estimates, now we can do an economic analysis of this market. Yes. Just to make sure I understand. So when you talk about factor models, right? You can write down factor models, like for example, in yields, mm -hmm. forward rates, in, in returns. So when you talk about the factor model, what do you have in mind? Here, and we'll talk about returns. If time permits, I can tell how these are connected. But what I will care about will be term structure premium statements that is related to expected return statements. So, so I want to do it in the return space. So what but this is bond returns. Bond returns. And right. not like the yield curve. I'm used to different factors, right? Of so, shift and uh, reshaping. So, so, so what most of the literature does, it, it fits a factor model in the yield space, yeah. you know, usually under risk neutral measures and then sort of thinks about mm -hmm. risk premia. So, um, you know, mm -hmm. but coming from the yield, modeling the yield curve mm -hmm. um, and then mm -hmm. use no arbitrage mm -hmm. restrictions, right? Let me talk more about these connections, but what I will talk about today, thinking about is a pure cross-sectional return modeling in the same way how we do it in, in the equity space. That's what I'm after. I will make you some, not, no arbitrage. I mean, that's... I will be a little bit more careful and I will talk about it, but I'm not looking at um, if you think about F fine term structure models because right. I think that's what you had in mind. Right. That's not what we're doing here. The way how you should think about it is really want to know what is the dimensionality of the uh, fixed income market. So I'm essentially going to show you that you only need four tradable portfolios and they replicate in, a, in an appropriate sense all fixed income claims. Now, given those four tradable portfolios, which I will call factor, you can then estimate your model of choice, like an f fine term structure model, because all these models first require a set of basis assets that you say have all the relevant information for this market. And then you are trying to estimate a dynamic, that means over time relationship. And I'm doing a pure cross-sectional dimension reduction here. And I will study how this cross-sectional factor model explains risk premium. And you use returns of coupon bonds or zero oh. coupon bonds? Now, because that is what where it becomes interesting, right? Did they yes. find models first construct zero coupon bonds and then estimate the yeah. structure? Right. So I will, uh, if you give me five minutes, I will show you the model. But the key element here is I will give you a conditional factor model for traded coupon bonds. So that's what people have not done. They usually do something. To get discount bond returns, claim that this is the truth, then build another model. We do essentially like an IPCA model, if that makes sense, for the tradable securities, and then show what the factor structure is to explain what you actually observe in terms of returns. The drawback of doing that is that it's hard to map it back to yield curve models that have been estimated well, using zero coupon bonds, right? Um, anyway, let, me, so that's, let, let me come back to this point, right? So we have three economic main findings I want to highlight. So remember when I did my PhD, I was already puzzled why we get level slope curves. So 
I think all of you have worked with some set of panel of yields or disk of bond prices or returns. Now when you do a principal component analysis, you get very specific shapes for the latent factors. And the point levels of curvature based on how the loadings look in this discount bond or yield um, mm -hmm. space. Now, I will always puzzle why those are the rights. Now we can actually tell you why you get that. So we prove that, or we show that for treasury markets, smoothness seems to be a fundamental principle. Essentially, good term structure curves are smooth curves. And we show that the optimal basis functions to approximate smooth curves are levels of curvature. So we can formally show it. So whenever the problem is to approximate a smooth relationship, you will get with a PCA on a panel of these estimated objects, levels of curvature type factors. And I will explain more what this means. The second thing is about risk. So what I'm showing here will be that exposure to bond factors, so that means risk loadings, are fully explained when I know the cash flow information of bonds. So if I know, for example, for a treasury bond, the coupon uh, payments, that gives me the same loading as I would run a time series regression factors. So instead of you know, characteristics are covariance, we show that cash flows are covariances in the bond price. So we show that for treasury markets, how to construct bond characteristics and how to think about risk. The last statement is about how, what is the dimensionality of the treasury market? So we show that there is what we call a complexity premium. So we document that four factors are sufficient to hatch and price any fixed income, default free fixed income claim in the treasury market. But the fourth factor, which is important to capture more complex shapes, seems to be extremely relevant to explain the term structure premium. And from an investment perspective, being able to invest into the sports factor seems to be an important catch for bad economic times. They can double or triple out of sample sharp ratios. We want to highlight this type of force factor wasn't even detected when people looked at Nelson Swenson Siegel or Gorgiana Zag and Wright discount curves because those discount curves are so bad, so biased in their estimation, they omit the type of shapes that we are after, which we can, which we can capture with a more precise method. Now, so, so, yeah. in, the, in the old days, we used to worry about on the run security. Mm -hmm. Take it out. Does this have any any relevance to your fourth no. power factor? I can talk more about the data set. Yeah. So, what we will do, we will use a very standard data set, which will be the same that going on the right, Farm and Bliss, Lu and Wu, and the other companion paper there with Damir. Do mm -hmm. where there are some filters. So you want treasury bonds that represent the same object. So it will only be off the run. It, there will be certain so you don't filters. Put it that, you don't deal with on the run. Security. Exactly. Uh -huh. Conceptually, there's nothing problematic for us to deal with it. But if there is another characteristic besides the cash flow maturities that leads to difference in prices, uh -huh. you will need to condition on that in your model. I mean, but we want to say the only thing we care about is how maturities affect returns and premium. That's what we are after. Okay. Um, so Margaret, it's, it's well known that if you get factors from in the yield space that they don't capture um, risk premium for holding period returns. That's the sort of like in all the, the corporate yeah, CAC mm -hmm. and stuff. So it's it's you know it's not surprising that the um, if you capture a sort of risk premium factor, it's not related to the level slope of curvature from the yield curve estimation. So I will tell you a little bit more about level slope curvature for yields and returns. Um, it's the way how people, you know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it yeah. Postpone it if you want to. Yeah. I don't want to hold you up. Yeah. But I think what really makes a difference here is that we say, look, there is actually a non parametric problem. You want to estimate a function. And then there is, you look at a matrix, a panel, and you do some kind of calculation. These two problems are connected. And you, people usually don't look at it. We can show that levels of curvature also arise in yields because you're trying to approximate a smooth yield curve. So the reason why you get certain latent factors is the same argument. Now, of course, the time series of returns and the time series of yields have mechanical differences. Um, and but I want to just from a cross sectional dimension, it's the same object. Now, let me just give very quickly the formal setup. What I care about is what I call the discount curve. 
So the disk on curve is applied on the disk on bond with maturity X. So X could be one year, then it's applied on disk on bond with maturity one dollar one year from now, or two years or three years. Because I care about any possible maturity, I model it as a function. Okay. Now, because I care about risk premium statements, I want to look at returns. So I will look at the return of discount bonds. And more specifically, because of the risk premium statement, I care about it will be exact return. So look at the return in excess of a discount bond with maturity of one day. I will have daily excess returns. Now, what do I observe? I observe treasury bonds, except for some maturities are coupon bonds. So for those treasury bonds, I observe prices and observe cash flows. So what are cash flows? These are, for example, the semi annual coupon payments and then the principal repayment. So what I'm the work will be the return of the treasury bonds, and I know the cash flow stream. Now, we all know that a coupon bond can be written as a portfolio of discount bonds. Exactly the same statement holds in the return space. You just need to transform the cash flow or the coupon payments accordingly, and I will call this cash flow instruments or normalized cash flows. So, in this kind of portfolio interpretation, now, empirically, this doesn't need to hold exactly if we allow for some kind of errors, which can be due to liquidity. But now I'm waving my hands. I'm just saying there should be this relationship, and I will think about how to deal with deviation from this relationship empirically later. Um, now, I can say I want to get a curve, which is a function, or I will just evaluate this function at all possible days. If I look at 10 years, it would be 3,650 different days. And then I get a vector of this bond excess returns. These are kind of the same objects, but I will use both perspectives because it's helpful for our understanding. So here I look at the vector of all the discount bond excess returns. Now, how could I estimate it? Uh, the naive way would be to say, well, I look at the candidate space for my return curves. The re candidate return curve gives me a model implied uh, treasury bond return. I observe it, the difference is a return error. I minimize this error, the return error, the observed treasury return error, and that's why I want to get my curve. Obviously, this is not going to work that easily because um, on a typical day, I have around 300 different treasury bonds traded. If I look at the early part of my sample, it's even less. If I want the full curve, I would need to estimate returns for 3,650 discount bonds if I go up to maturity of 10 years, if I go lower than maturity, even more. Right? So I have much more parameters then I have observations, so I need to regularize the problem. One way is to either assume um, a functional form, for example, a parametric model like Nelson Swenson Siegel. And we will show that these are biased and misspecified models, so they will give you wrong results. Or you impose some form of regularization. Um, and now what we are doing, and I think that makes a difference, we are much more transparent and based more on fundamental insight of how we regularize the model and how we impose assumptions. So the only thing that we are arguing is that a good curve should be smooth. So why smooth? Well, the idea of smooth is that bonds with similar maturity should have similar returns. If that is not satisfied, uh, then you can create trading strategies, dynamic trading strategies that create very large payoffs. Now, empirically, the trading the returns that you get by trading bonds are limited. So by putting bounds on the smoothness, we put bounds on how much money you can make by trading treasury bonds. And we view this a little bit in the spirit of limits uh, to, to arbitrage, right? So we put bounds on infeasible payoffs by saying the curve should be smooth. Now, how could that be modeled? So I can write down a population problem where I say, I want to have an appropriate set of curves. This can be a lot of function. I'll talk more about this in a second. And I want to trade off the return error and the smoothness of my curve. There will be a parameter, I call it lambda, that captures this trade-off, right? If I increase lambda, curve should be smoother. Um, now, how could I model smoothness? So look at the function. A natural way to model smoothness is the second derivative. Because different um, maturities should get different weight in terms of smoothness. You can have a smoothness parameter alpha here that allows us to put different weights for different maturities. This is the right way to measure smoothness for discount curves and their returns. We have a companion paper where we talk in much more generality about first, second derivatives, how to weight it, and we show that that is the right way to approach the problem. I have some questions. Yeah, so, please. Um, I mean, the 
there may, there are a few perpetuals floating around, but basically your sample is, you know, a lot of long as we trace maybe 30 years. No. Um, so in order for the for the time beyond three years not to matter yeah. much, alpha has to be discounted fairly heavily. And I'm wondering whether that's whether this exponential form is what you really want to do or whether you want to take something that's less discounted and just truncate it or something like that. This is what you want to do. I don't discuss it much in this paper. We have this other paper, uh, which is more theoretical, where we show that this alpha corresponds to the infinite maturity yields. It's only relevant for extrapolation, not for interpolation. So if you go up to 30 years, alpha doesn't really matter if it is in a reasonable range. If you want to use a model to extrapolate, essentially the choice of alpha tells you how you extrapolate curves. Do we have any bonds longer than 30 years from maturity? Not in the yes. Mm -hmm. If you look at other markets like UK, you have longer, but they, but get... they have like perpetual rates mm -hmm. and data out there. So this is another project. I'm happy to talk about it. For the moment, I will just tell you, let's look at this as a smoothness measure. I can talk more about the work that we have done in the other papers where it's about how to think about extrapolation, how we think about markets that have longer maturities, et cetera. So, so one thing you could do is estimate it up to like the, the 20 year only, and then see what the model implies for the 30 year and, and compare it to the observed period. So we have that. So we have a, a very long paper and all the estimates that we have are publicly available too. So you can also look at our... So, so one more question. I mean, in your sample, I assume you have very different uh, sort of reliefs, right? So um, in the 70s to the whatever, you have a stochastic declining nominal yields, mm -hmm. and then you have the zero, you know, uh, zero lower bound. Is it possible that you might get different? Um, Very good question. Functions. I will talk about this later too. I will. I give you a very quick preview here. Um, now I haven't given you the model that estimates. So it's a little bit hard to talk about what changes and what not. But the cross-sectional relationship between bonds is extremely stable for the sixty or seventy years that our sample has. What does change is, for so example, the importance. Of, yeah, what changes will be its importance of certain shapes. So it's not like if you use is the same factor, but the loading of factors can change, but the risk premium of factor will be time value. That's a nice result. And we have a lot of results where I will talk about it and how this relates to economic macroeconomic regimes. Yeah. But that is later after I've given you the model setup. Um, just what is the right function space? Now, this is actually a quite nice result. We use all twice differential functions. We prove the paper that any algebra free risk of a return curve has to be twice differentiable. So we look at all reasonable return curves. So we don't rule anything else by using ad hoc assumptions. And so it's a very flexible model. The only choices that we have to make is how we trade off smoothness versus return error and how we look at um, different maturities and we let the data speak. So we will look at which lambdas and alphas give us the best out of sample fit, right? So it's a data-driven approach is very flexible. Similar now, question now. Uh -huh. So are you what you mean is that the curve must be smooth across different treaties, but it doesn't have to be smooth across different time, right? Um, that is a different question. I will show you that. Um, so here, I'm looking at a problem for one day at a time. So I haven't even looked at a time series. I've just looked at one day as a cross-section. Exactly. I can estimate these models for each day, which we did, and we can talk about if something changes empirically, you want the same model over time. Nothing changes. So my actual question is that can we actually use your method for the prediction purposes? For example, predicting the shape of the terms of curve for next week, for example. So let me, yes and no. I mean, what I will want to talk about today is a cross-sectional exercise. Cross-section means I have a large set of assets and I want to be able to replicate them with a very small number of assets. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to you label this fact with assets as factors and talk about a risk perspective. Now, the same way when you do a cross-section factor model is not necessarily a prediction model per se. You can build a model to predict uh, the conditional risk premium factors. It means you do some kind of prediction of factor returns. And once you combine it with a cross-sectional model, you get a prediction of the rest. But that is more like a complementary question. So the main point is understanding the cross-sectional structure. I will talk about the 
conditional risk premium of factors and how it relates to macroeconomic regimes later on, which have a little bit of a flavor of what you're talking about. Um, but really what we can say very accurately is how different bonds or bonds with different securities will relate relative to each other. I can, if you want to think of this as a prediction, I can do it in a very accurate way. Mm -hmm. Saying if the yield curve will be up or downward sloping tomorrow, that is about predicting um, uh, uh, the conditional mean of factors, right. and that is a separate problem. Um, now, this is a complicated problem, and we use a solution that is based on what's called reproducing Colonel Hilbert spaces. Um, now, what we are uh, leveraging here is something that's very heavily used machine learning, the so called celebrated representer theory. It's going to simply find infinite dimensional optimization problem to finite dimension one. So just to recap, right? We want to get, we have a lot of functions that we can estimate. Functions are non infinite dimensional objects, but by specifying the function space um, twice differentiable as the objective function, trading off return and smoothness, we uniquely pin down what the basis functions are for this complex problem, and our solution will be linear in the basis functions. Well, specifically, it will be simple rich regression with basis functions. That's really nice from an estimation practical perspective. It's important because linearity, as I said, maps into tradability, factor modeling, so we can use this whole machinery moving forward. Now, what are the basis functions? So, in a reproducing kernel, Hilbert space implies what is called a kernel. This kernel implies basis functions. Now, we have an analytical formula for this kernel, we can show what it looks like. What is more interesting, that's what I want to emphasize here. So we have a solution that's linear in the kernel, and without a lot of generality, we can look at the spectral decomposition of the kernel. Since we do a PCA on the matrix that is implied by the problem. And these eigenvectors will be our basis functions. The reason why we do it is because these eigenvectors, we know what their properties are. So we can prove that the first vector here is the smoothest vector in Rn. The second vector in B is the second smoothest vector in Rn orthogonal to the first one. So this is if you want to smooth, span smooth functions, then exactly the form that you want to take. And the first vector looks like a slope, the second like a curvature. Because if you look at, the, um, so the patterns that you get with PCA are because we're trying to fit a smooth problem. And I will talk about this later. I have one technical slide, so that is it. So please bear with me, that's our main result. So the problem was basically that this is a return curve, and that will be linear in what we will call factors or tradable portfolios. And the coefficients on these factors, we call them betas, are simply these um, uh, basis functions that are given by the kernel. To estimate these factors, we solve the rich regression problem, right? There's the fact that there are coefficients on the loading, I mean, we regress factors on the loadings, where we have a rich penalty here. And what are the loadings? The loadings for treasury bonds are the loadings for discount bonds multiplied by the cash flow uh, instruments, right? Mm -hmm. so what you're estimating is a conditional factor model with a regularization. What is really key here is what we call factors will be a tradable portfolio of treasury bonds. The portfolio weight on these factors you know, are exactly the, the solution to a rich regression. Now, this was in mass. Now, let me say it in words. So, what I find exciting is we have a complicated problem, it's a general curve fitting problem, and we can give you a regression solution. I mean, that's amazing to begin with. Whoever has tried to estimate all these yields with some of these estimates, you know, these are hard to do, unstable, etc. Now, it's easy to implement, it's also easy to interpret. So, there's a rich penalty. Penalizes higher order basis function, which means a less smooth basis function. We should exactly do, right? Now, what is key, and that's the only estimate in the literature that gives you tradability, what we call factors are investable portfolios of trade coupons. What we call discount bonds are portfolios of factors, and they are investable. And so if this model is precise to replicate coupon bonds, then it gives us also a portfolio, like a hatching portfolio, right? So we can do immunization and hatching and replication for any tradable uh, vehicle free its income security. Are now, yes? Question about the word investable. Are these long short portfolios? This will be long short. And I mean, we can talk about the practice. Costs in your investable portfolios? Well, 
I can put any constraints when I solve the problem, and I could in principle account for transaction costs, etc. We have not done that. We are not doing right. it because it's not a critical mm -hmm. measure. Right. I, I just want to know what you right. mean by investable. But investable for me means I can map it back into uh -huh. tradable assets. Just which, a comment. The word means other things and other like linear it, combinations it, might be better. Yeah. Pharma yeah. Pharma yeah. Rich yeah. portfolios are yeah. are investable in the sense you say, but in fact they're it's not investable. The analog to how we think about a pharma French portfolio, you know, ignoring transaction costs yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so a, a different word, a, a different word in this in this room it's fine. A, yeah. a different word might be a better choice yeah. depending on who you want to talk to. Right. So so in principle, you could do this also in the yield space, which we have done. So the only seven. difference would be essentially the Z matrix would be it would be a different way exactly to just look, get from the well, keep on going. Duration. Uh, yeah. Right, exactly. But, I mean, but the methodology sure. works also for the yield space. We have a separate paper. We call it splitting the discount curve, which does exactly that. Yeah. The reason is I wanted to get linear factors. No, that's it's fine. It's just, you know, yeah, that's, that's completely fine. I, I have a question of something you said a slide ago. Referred to. You said that it was the smoothness. Did you, did you did I understand correctly? You said it's the smooth the search for smoothness that made these shapes mm -hmm. okay but why not say there are economic forces that make these shapes like the main thing that a yield curve does mm -hmm. not the only thing is goes up and down and that's a parallel shift and the second order thing it does mm -hmm. is it, it steepens or flattens and that that's that's your second thing well, why is it a mathematical driver and not an economic question so Number one, we motivate smoothness based on we think economic arguments, oh, right? Yeah. So we say okay. smoothness relates to in I mean non-smooth curve will relate to infeasible payoffs, right? So there's an economic argument why it might make sense yeah. to look at that. We don't know what's the right degree of smoothness. Um, so let the data speak about this. Mm -hmm. I will interpret the factors and the properties moving forward, but I just want to highlight. So far, the word factor model is not low dimension. What I meant, factors are just linear tradability, linear representation of tradable security. Yeah. Because what our factors here is a number of basis function, which is equal to the number of days. So I have 3,650 factors here in this model that I wrote down. Um, the next step is, of course, as well, can I do just as well by keeping two, three, or four of these factors? And that comes to a sparse parsimonious factor model. Now, I do want to clarify like, the reason why I talk about an unconditional model for this compound is because what I call have a floating scale is constant. And when I talk about a conditional model for coupon bond is because the loadings for coupon bonds here will be conditional on time varying characteristics. Um, just to make clear why I use this notation. So if you did a lasso regression to the bridge, you would. It would, would not be necessarily smoothness, but um, sparsity, right? So like an elastic net. Right? Well, then but, you'd be right, right killing I mean, not reducing. You're jumping, but, you're jumping ahead, right? <laughs> so I what this paper is about, we want to know, can we reduce the dimensionality? That means can we get a small number of factors? Yeah. What I could do is I could, in an ad hoc way, select the first two, three basis functions, which are these factors, and see if they do the job. And you can modify the theory to say, what, how does the regression analysis looks like if you select the first ones? Or you can say, well, let's select a sparse set of basis functions or sparse set of factors in a data-driven way. So I say, I want to get the best model for a three-factor specification or four-factor. The way I can do it is by using a data-driven selection by adding a lasso. So what I get is an elastic net regression to the problem. Yeah. And then I can get the optimal data driven model to explain trade actual observed treasury returns, right? So we will look at this. Now what is in, and I will talk more about this. What is interesting, this will exactly select the first basis functions. Mm -hmm. So I will end up with just selecting the, the, in the same order as if I would take the first ones. And the reason that we prove it also formally both rich and lasso will just um, try to select the dominant the eigenvectors with the dominant eigenvalues. One is hard stress holding, the other one is soft stress holding yeah. for this problem. Um, 
Now, let's talk about the empirics, which I think is um, the more interesting part. Um, and just to be clear about what is the data, we use a very standard data set. It's the same, you know, like Lou and Wu, uh, Gorian is again right, and what we have in our other companion paper. Um, so it's from Chris, we use um, a mid prices, it's from 61 to 2020. I will show you here only results up to 10 years of maturities because I want to get a panel uh, where I do not do extrapolation because I want to look at time series. We have estimates also for longer maturity, but then it becomes a question of how do we deal with extrapolation or shorter time series. Let's just focus on this data set. Yes. Another thing that you could, you might, everything I'm asking you seems like we already have done. Um, but if you did this with the constructed zero coupon bonds instead of um, the, the coupon bonds, would be interesting to see whether you get similar results. What's a constructed zero coupon? They made it a synthetic one? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there are actually some right. zeros so that trade. And there's certain, there are many assumption approximations to get the zero coupon bonds. <laughs> Would be interesting to see uh, if you did this with actual with the synthetic zero coupon bonds, um, and see if you get very similar results or not. If you don't, then the zero coupon bonds are you know very different in some sense from so the. What do you bonds. mean by? Um, I mean, for short maturities, I love zero coupon bonds, and you want to ask if my model implied ones are the same. No, if you actually estimate the model mm -hmm. with zero coupon bonds. You can construct a zero coupon bond right. by. Oh, you mean I first system. estimate my model, then estimate it again? Yeah. Sorry. Right. So you estimate the model with coupon mm. bonds. Yeah. Now yeah. you could also, con you can construct mm. zero coupon bonds every day, mm. right? That's what people normally do when they estimate mm. a little curves. So use that data and estimate the model on the zero coupon bonds at key rates. Mm. Exactly. So, so that we see if, for talking to the market, that's right. a good phrase to keep in mind, even if it, it right. takes they're, dumb stuff. And they're synthetic, but right? they're constructed, they're estimated that, from the coupon bonds. That, but it's just, interesting to see if the results you get are different or similar. I, I have actually something along those lines. I will show this later. Um I you cannot imagine how much time you have spent. This is not a project of one. I mean, this has been Five year. I mean, he started her PhD with that, and she already worked for two years now. <laughs> so it has been, I don't know. You're, you're preaching to a whole room full of people who do that. So we have replicated all methods like Lou and Wu, got their synthetic zero coupon bonds, and estimate and compare our results and our main findings using their estimate. I mean, so I will show you. What I'm saying is use your estimation, hmm? but the input instead of coupon hmm? bonds, the input. Should be zero coupon bonds, mm -hmm. and it's to see whether the results are mm -hmm. similar or different. If they're very different, then then the, the zero coupon bonds might be problematic. I they're probably in a very different. Don't think that different sorts of people buy I mean, them. So the market what we have is a simulation. I mean, I will just be brief here because I want to show you the results. I think are more relevant, but we also have simulation exercise where I get zero coupon bonds from another method. Put in noise and apply my method to the simulated data, and I try to understand what I learned. And bottom line, along the metrics that I cared about, it works really well in the simulations that we had. I'm not sure it's exactly the statement you have in mind, but um, just what I want to clarify here is um, first step is I just want to understand is this a good model or not. So I want to look at return errors out of sample, some form of group squared error. Um, I will leave one out. But what mean, what it means is I take all my traded treasury bonds, I take one of them out, I estimate my return curve, price the one that's out of sample, and I repeat it for all possible combinations. Um, what I want to focus on here will be what I call the full model, which is this model where I don't set a sparse set of factors, and a low dimensional model with n factors. The reason why I do that is n. We have a companion paper called Ring the Discount Curve, where we replicate all the yield curve estimators used in the literature and do a horse race. So we have this out of sample horse race along a lot of different dimensions. We will show that our full model is the most precise one for out of sample yield estimation and pricing of securities. The reason is parametric models are misspecified. 
And a lot of the non formatic methods use some form of ad hoc assumption, which lead to instability, etc. I will show you some results. But I just want to tell you, I'm not doing a complete horse race with all the existing SMLs here because it's a different paper. What about what is the dimensionality? That's what I want to focus on. Um, just to tell you, what are the other models? And you, you can use parametric model, which is not so essential, or a specific implementation of this parametric model uh, that Kunitz like and Wright did, where they were careful about filter choices. And then there are non parametric methods like Fama Bliss. Just to be clear, so Fama Bliss does exact fitting of observed prices. And then you're using a piecewise interpolation of the forward curve for the exact in sample fits. This will work terribly out of sample. I mean, and I will show you some results to give you intuition. There's another paper that's a GAP paper by Lin Wu. What they are doing with the kernel is different from when we talk about kernel. What they are doing is a local kernel smoother. So they want to know the yield of a discount bond. They look at the treasury bond with the yield, the eight treasury bond that they have a yield that is closest to this, and then they take a weighted average of those yields using a norm a Gaussian kernel. Um, we show that this is very unstable because local smoothing means if you have an outlier, completely uh, your curve goes up. None of those map in a linear model. They all give artificial returns and artificial prices. None of those can be mapped linearly into traded securities. Um, so, and if you want to do this factor model, you need some form of linear mapping. So, that's the first paper that can actually do this analysis. Let me start with a basic question. You know, I have these two parameters, lambda and alpha. What is good? What I'm showing you is this cross out of sample return error for different choices of smoothness and different choices for the maturity weight. So, what happens if I take lambda close to zero, then I do exact in sample fitting. Out of sample, this is bad. What happens if I take lambda very large? I mean, if I put push lambda to the limit, I get a linear function that is not flexible. Enough. The curves are more complicated than this. The optimal choice of lambda is in the middle region. Doesn't matter to get it down exactly, but the point is um, a good choice. You need some kind of trade off between smoothness to, to get a good out of sample fit. What about alpha? Well, as long, you know, let's say we take lambda 10. As long as I take alpha in a reasonable region, it doesn't have any effect. And we proved this in the other paper that alpha only matters for extrapolation. For the interpolation problem, we can just focus on the smoothness. Now, what about the dimensionality? Uh, so what I'm showing you here is this out of sample fit for different smoothness parameters and different numbers of factors where it just takes them in their canonical order based on smoothness. Um, Let's say we fix lambda equal to 10, I fix alpha to 5%, just for a benchmark. And now look what happens if I take factors. So if I take factors up to four, five, six, I am almost as good as if I take 3650, right? So the point is there seems to be a low dimensionality. Now we need to talk about what's the right metric when we want to reduce dimensionality, what do we care about? But there seems to be evidence that the, you only need the dominating basis functions to get a relatively good model. So we'll focus for a lot of the rest of the talk on the first six basis functions now, because that already gives me most of the out sample approximation. Now, which factor should I take? Uh, let's use the lasso to select the best factor if I want the one factor model, or a two factor or a three factor model. And I show the frequency because I do it day by day, and I show the frequency. How often for a two factor model, I would take the first two basis functions based on smoothness and so on. But on a four factor model, I almost always take the first four factors. So this provides evidence that the optimal order for factors seems to be based on the current of the smoothness order, right? So moving forward, I will just use the smoothness order when I talk about a one, two, three, four, five, six factor model. Uh, yes. Structure of factors, or the, simply the number of factors, it may depend on the regimes between no I agree. prices. Mm -hmm. So I take this as evidence. I'm not gaining much mm -hmm. by selecting factor ten instead of factor three when I want this three factor model. Yeah, um, just to, mm -hmm. to say, with much cruder methods, these same insights were available in the nineties. I that's fine. I, but, I mean, I'm not. But 
none of those methods look, I mean, as far as I can tell you, at the actual treasury bond returns, right? Oh, you usually yeah. look at synthetic so, stuff. So in bar, but we saw the discussion maybe before lunch, but I can tell you how they used to build the term structure models in, in bar. This was my first education. I'm very interested to have another one here. But uh, that was certainly um, done with a very clear conscientiousness about how the market thought about it in addition to mathematical considerations. And I, th this is, I think, um, clearly more, more elegant along many lines. But uh, just to say that these cruder methods got into a lot of the same so, things known long ago. And curiously, uh, I have come back to, after spending 12 years doing pretty much full-time equities, I've come back to fixed income. And I opened up the fixed income models. And to my amazement, all of these factors were gone and they reverted back to key rate models uh, because that's how the market likes to think about it, which seems seems like a, 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 a backward step in terms of of the uh, good modeling, but it is how, how they're being presented now. So I didn't use the word, but what we have, you can think of it as a bottom model for fixed income because I have a pure cross-section regression model. I get factors by re regressing on cross-sectional objects, yeah. which are my temporary formation. Bar does it Bar does it today. I, I, I read the modern documentation of them and also BlackRock creates these, which are just bar and not props. And, uh, they have gone from the types of factors that you have, this is not a step forward in my opinion, back to uh, to key rate, which is how traders like to think about it. I mean, you could argue whenever you build cross-sector models for cross-sectional regressions, yeah. you might think the key challenge is how you transform the variables that you use in this cross-sectional regression. Mm -hmm. You know, because the way how you do transformations of what we call characteristics has an effect on what factors you get, right? Totally. And this transformation is where this basis function I was talking about come in, right? And let me now talk about the stuff that I was the most exciting about because I spent many, many years, you know, trying to analyze their levels of curvature type habits. Now I want to look at the first six factors that I get out of my model. I want to understand them, okay? And one way to understand it is to look at how these factors look like in terms of weights on the zero coupon bonds. Because my model gives me a theoretical weight uh, that I should have a zero coupon bonds. That was this function V, if you remember, right? The function V for the first factor is how you would load on zero coupon bonds to construct the first factor. And the fun vector V2 would be the, <coughs> the left line, the way how theoretically my factor would load on zero coupon bonds. So if you look at this pattern, you might say, well, that looks familiar. If you have ever done a PCA on these markets, you might get something similar. What I'm going to do now, I calculate or estimate my discount bonds with my method for uh, every day for 10 years, create a panel and do a principal component analysis and look at the loading of my principal components. That is what the orange line looks like. This looks very, very similar, right? So what is going on here? Now, for my black line, I don't need a time scale, right? On any given day, I already have this pre-specified. I just know that the optimal basis functions for a smooth curve approximation are these black lines. The reason why with a PCA I get these shapes is because the problem is smooth and the PCA will just pick up the smooth basis functions because it is optimal for describing the problem. Now, it's not mechanical. So we actually show that this is an empirical finding that this is the case. It's not mechanical. Let me show you one thing here. What happens if you take a data that is very popular, there's a Nelson Svensson Siegel implementation that's going on as I get right. If you create discount bond returns, you do a PCA, you will get the um, orange line. If you compare it with the PCA on our discount bonds, you see that clear deviations in particular from IRO factors. And that's by construction, because if you have a misspecified model, certain shapes are not in the data to begin with, so you will never find them, right? But what about the following? If I now take a message that is more precise than Nelson Swenson Siegel, that is the Lewin Wu message from the JV paper, it's not as good as ours, but it's the second best method if you want to approximate good yield curves. You use them to construct these artificial discount bonds. 
You do a PCA, blue and blue is the light blue line, our model is the orange and black line. It's essentially the same. So the blue and blue method is not doing anything with the smoothness penalty. It's not, it's just a relatively precise approximation. But as soon as we have a precise enough approximation of this one bonds, you will discover patterns that are based on smoothness. And the way how we interpret it is smoothness is an underlying principle for treasury markets. And even if you use a not smooth method, once we look at a panel, essentially the pattern we want to detect are based on smoothness. We can show that the same finding holds if you look at equity markets too. If I take stocks, I sort them into 10 decimals based on size. I create a panel, I do a PCA. My PC is look like level slope curvature because conditional expected returns are relatively smooth function in the size. Um, now, this year, just to be clear, I don't have the level because I look at excess return. I essentially took the level out. If I put in the level, I get a level and then the slope. But that is a mechanical element. Now, the other thing is about how long do I have? Because it's all perfect. Because I was a student outside and I thought you stop at noon and I got nervous. Don't be nervous. So the other thing is, I talked about loadings so far, right? But if you think about finance and asset pricing, loadings are related to risk. Risk means you want co-movement with risk factors. Everything I did so far was purely cross-sectional. There was no time series that I really used. Now, what I'm doing now is I will look at the time series regression loadings when running all S regression on my factors versus the model implied cross-sectional loadings. Now, for uh, discount bonds, I should expect constant loading. So take my estimated model of discount bonds with a full model, and then run time series regression on my first six factors. And I show the regression slope from the time series regression as a model implied, uh, that means you know this factor V from the thermal, and they're the same. So if I look at correlations, or if I look at cross-sectional cash flow information, it's exactly the same values. Now, this was for discount bonds. If I look at coupon bonds, treasury bonds, the same holds. But of course, if I run a time series regression, I wouldn't expect a constant beta because the cash flow of coupon bonds are time varying. You know, the moment you pay a coupon, you should expect a change in your loading function, right? And the maturity changes of coupon bonds. So what I will do is a local window regression. I take a one year rolling window and run a regression on my factors. And I do it for three different bonds. Uh, these are coupon bonds with three, five, and nine years of maturity. And then I have the model implied loadings. You know, these are cross sectional loadings. The dashed lines are my model implied loadings. And um, the solid lines are for the time series regression. If I look at factor one for the three SMP, factor two, factor three, factor four, you see we get the same paths. Um, so the way how we take it, Cash flows and time series covariance will send the same information, they lead to the same betas. So, like cash flows are covariance, that is like the statement that Brian Kelly had in his IPCA paper characteristics are covariances. So, it can get risk exposure either through modeling characteristics or time series information. This is like a model IPCA version for the treasury market. So, I don't need a time series for an asset. The moment you tell me, the cash flow information, I tell you the exposure to risk, I tell you how to hedge it. Now, we have a, can have a debate how many factors do we need? Now, I have some experts in this room, right, when it comes to the question, and whenever we talk about how many factors do we need, it's a question of what is the metric and what are the test assets. Because when you look at explaining returns in treasury returns, um, that was a heat map, it looked like I need at least four to get the number sufficiently low. Now, what people have often done in the literature, they estimated yields, then they do a PCA and they say, oh, the first two, three PCA explain 99% of the variation in my panel. I need two or three factors, end of story. Why is this argument potentially, why is it misleading? There are two reasons. First of all, it's about the question of test assets and then about the metric. In fact, here I show you how much variation I explain in my complete panel of discount bond returns as we do the full model. If I take the first PR factor, this first two, first three, the black line uses the modeling implied loadings, and then the other one is a PCA, right? 
which is an in-sample PCA. And you see we explain the same amount of variation as our whole world is PCA, right? So it's a confirmation PC is and all factors are the same. But the first two would explain 98%, right? That's something we already have observed. Then the econometric paper by Crump and Kosporino, they already have also argued, right, looking at returns or yields is misleading because you have a mechanical overlapping relationship. But if you think about yields, um, um, you know, a yield is like the sum of forward rates. So you have a nine-year yield and a 10-year yield. They have a component of nine years that is overlapping, which just creates a lot of correlation in this data. So they argue to look at forward rates. In our case, it would be forward returns. So if I create forward returns, which is essentially like taking differences in the returns, and then see how much do I need to explain a lot of variation. I need four factors to explain around 90% variation. These two factors will only explain around 70%. The point is, the right test assets might be better modeled as forward re returns instead of uh, returns, right? So I'm just trying to say, um, four factors, we can find arguments why we need four factors to explain variation. And I can show more the difference between correlation of forward returns and returns and why there's a mechanical structure, but I'm going to skip this. Um, I want to know what asset price is now. Um, so maybe quick recap, which again, for this audience is probably unnecessary, but we find evidence that a lot of, or most of the variation is explained by four I call them tradable KR factors, but factors that map into tradable securities. But that doesn't mean that the mean return of all my discount bonds is well explained, right? So there's a question about explaining risk premium versus explaining variation. So now I want to talk about risk premium. Um, so the point is, if I can explain mean and variation with my first four KR factors, then I should be able to replicate any fixed income claim, right? Now, what I want to get is in the end also a stochastic discount factor based on my factor model, right? So the SDF is a, can be modeled in projection on the asset space. Here, of course, I can only talk about the SDF projected on the fixed income space. I will not talk about an equity SDF, for example. Um, now, without a lot of general, we just need to project the SDF on the discount bonds because these are the basis assets for this whole um, asset space. Now, if I can span all discount bonds with my four factors, then it's sufficient to project my SDF on the four factors. That means I create a tangency portfolio and look at out of sample shot ratios. And that's what I'm going to use as a metric here. Um, and then again, looking at out of sample shot ratios of implied SDF based on factors also tells me something about the trading profitability um, of these assets. Now, let me start with risk premiums. What I'm going to show here will be the mean of my discount bond excess return. So that's what I would call the risk premium. And on the left-hand side, I show you what happens if I use different type of estimators. On the right-hand side, I will look at different number of factors. Let's start on the left. So our model, the full model that uses all factors, would be the black line. And if I use four latent, uh, the four factor model, it would be the orange line, very close. What happens if I use the pharma bliss data? That's publicly available, a lot of people use it. This would be the average return based on all these ones. Now, what you can see here is this is a very unstable term structure being occurred because that is a method that does in sample fitting, that is prone to overfitting. Now, if you try to learn models that explain this curve, you're very likely trying to fit some spurious results, right? Even if you look at the other curves, like uh, Nelson, Trent, and Siegel, you see there are systematic biases in the term structure. That means if I estimate my discount bonds with Nelson, Trent, and Siegel, and then build a model that explains the term structure premium, I would try to explain a spurious pattern in the data, right? So you see that for term structure premium estimation, the method, the method that you use seems to matter. Now, what about the number of factors in our model. So what I will now use as a full model as a benchmark, and I want to ask how close do I get for means to the full model. So black line is a full model. If I take a one factor model, the relationship is a linear function, right? Because it's just a slope factor. That is not good, right? So the difference between the black line and let's say the um, orange line, you can interpret as an alpha. The difference is in mean in expected means and the model implied means. 
So if I take a two-factor um, um, two-factor model, I'm still far away. Three-factor model, I'm far away. But this four-factor model seems to be very important to explain the mean returns. The paper we want to pitch the idea that there's a little bit like a weak factor analogy. Factor number four is not dominant in explaining variance, but it seems to make a very big difference if we want to explain mean returns of this one policy. Now, what about conditional term pressure premium? I can do the same analysis as before, but I look at the mean return of this one bonds condition on different macroeconomic regimes. Here I use NVR recessions. The main point I want to make here is that the differences between the curves, if you look at Pharma Bliss, for example, or Nelson Siegel, relative to the black line, is much more pronounced during recessions. So the moment you want to estimate a model that explains term structure premium conditional on something, it might matter even more how you get your discount bonds in the first place. Um, let me show you the same result for different number of factors. So again, I'm looking at the mean returns of discount bonds, either for the full model or for factor models. And I show it if I condition time to the recessions or both. Term structure curves are much simpler than books. So here, using a very flexible model, it might be less relevant compared to in recession. In recessions, you see that the pricing errors that you would get in one, two, or three factor model would be much more pronounced than, um, than during the uh, good economic times. The way I interpret this is that um, the term structure premium requires a complex curve. This complex curve has a premium, and this premium is captured by our force um, factor. Um, and that factor has not been used generally in the literature. Yes. You did this in different subsamples. So in times of declining yields versus the um, zero lower bound, would you get also differences or not? Let's see if I have the appendix. We did something like this. I mean, just tell me, you don't have to. I did not look at zero low bound. What I looked is the, the yield spread, which, oh, yeah, yes, the yield spread, I estimate yield with our massive, and I look at the 10 year minus one year yield. Yeah. And then I look at tersals, lowest tersal of the yield spread up to highest tersal. So the lowest tersal has an inverted yield curves, and high yield spread means, you know. So I would like to see different regimes because you're, yeah. so. 70s, 80s, when mm. declining yields, and then... Now, it's inverted yield curve also. Right now, but for mm. example, zero low bounds, I mean, I would expect the, the complexity of the term structure is probably very different, right? I love this question because that will be the next part. We define the complexity measure where we are going over time to look at the importance of factors, which is really... I think in this particular plot that you showed mm. um, on the... Screen, yeah, I think it would, would be interesting to see this one mm -hmm. for different uh, subsamples. Yeah, we, we can do that. We have different condition variables, but we did not look at uh, 70s, 80s like this. We, we, we look at different conditioning variables. But yeah, um, let me I have some results, which we'll talk about time and complexity. But let me show you what I think is, in my opinion, the second most interesting result. I can create my implied SDF. So it create a mean variable efficient portfolio using one or two or three or four factors. And I can look at the returns of this portfolio. I will do this in an out of sample uh, exercise where I use the last 20 years to create my mean variable efficient portfolio. And then I get an investable strategy for the next day and so on, right? What I'm showing you here is the cumulative returns of the implied SDFs for one to four factors gray shaded areas of NPR recession periods. Now, what do you see? You just have a slope factor, and then it would be this light blue line. So you get a boost from having um, curvature factors included. Having a complexity factor gives you a boost of two to three times. Now, what is interesting? When does it give you the boost? Every time you go into a recession, you get a boost if you have this complex shape factor included in the portfolio. It seems like our complexity premium pays off in recessions, and there seems to be some kind of fetching you can do by capturing complex shape of the yield curve. Are you and, going to say anything more about what this fourth factor looks like? Yes. Well, I will. Yes, I will give you more structure. So, what's what? What are the linear combinations that matter? 
Well, okay. Just to be clear, the fourth factor, right? Yeah. It, it's, it has this combination in terms of discount bonds. So it, that is a functional interpretation. Now I will show you in zero coupon or this one. These are zero coupon bond yeah. franchise, right? Um, so factor number four has these portfolio weights. What I will show later will be time series properties of the factor. And then I want to so talk it's short in the one and six to seven to eight, and then long um, in the four to six, something like that. Yeah. I mean, from an investment perspective, I think the way how I, if I look at this as a problem of approximating function, I could also argue this factor is important to capture complex shapes. And therefore it pays off in a portfolio where I have access to all the factors. So you could put it differently. Um, if I omit factor four, you, you would get, uh, these error. I mean, you, you can look at where you, you in the long end you make yeah, errors. Right? The SDF mm -hmm. cumulative return, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this one, mm -hmm. right? So this is only about the fourth factor, right? So this mm -hmm. is a combination of mean value efficient portfolio factor one to four, right? So the combination of all four. Oh, I see. So if you, we have the time to explore those individual factors, but we think they're less informative. It's more like what you get by combining them. Their span that matters. I think so. If you're arguing the fourth factor is really important, and I think looking at the particular this fourth factor, I think that that would be. We think it's important when combined with the rest. So it adds a lot when you look at the span. So the sharp ratio by itself is not that. It, high. it will. It is higher than the others. I have this. I will talk about the sharp ratio of individual factors in a second. So, so I guess what but, I'm asking if you. Okay, what's the optimal SDF if I have any combination of two of those four factors? Mm -hmm. Do you would you select the first and the first fourth? and fourth? Be my guess. Mm -hmm. First and fourth. You would not suggest the first and second. No, no, because the uh, first one is sort of the essentially it's an average. Of, yeah, you know, it's like a high minus low. Exactly, yeah. and then the the, the fourth. Probably as the highest. Um, if the jingly shapes. You would do the one first and fourth. Mm -hmm. What I can show you to give some numbers here, I can look at the out of sample shot ratio of combining the thing, the first, the first two, one to three, one to four. I know it's not exactly, but it, it shows you already, you get a boost unconditionally out of sample shot ratio. But if I would look at the same mean value efficient portfolio, but evaluated only during booms or recession, adding factor of four more than doubles sharp ratio during a recession. That's really when it pays off. So if you add this to your portfolio, it gives you money during very specific time periods. So it's so, a... so for to this sorry, this to this experiment, you're estimating the model. You know, so if you just estimated the model on on um booms, mm -hmm. boom, if you so the estimation is different in booms. And in, in recessions, here we use the same model, right? But if you estimate, would you get that the, for example, that the struct the could be that the fourth factor is actually the second factor if you estimate it only in recessions? We can look into that, um, possibly. We I can, is there how. Guaranteed is it that the recessions are just exactly when the when the yield curves are inverted? Well, there's a relationship between this. I will talk a little bit more about this. Not, not too but, much more because we're not about to get overrun by students. Mm -hmm. But we, we can but, right. So there's definitely a state dependence in terms of how these factors pays off. And I want to talk about state dependence when factors are important. So how can I measure the importance? I can look at how much variation to explain in the data like the one factor, two factor, three or four factor model. It's essentially root mean squared average day by day. Um, now, this is what you see, there's variation over time. And now what we have constructed are two measures that come back to how complex shapes might be relevant. One we call the treasury market complexity. That says how much does your model, the, the explained variation improve if you go from a one factor to four factor model. Who is the difference from the black line with the one factor model to the like blue line with the four factor model, right? So that essentially 
tells you how much more relevant is to have these shapes that are not linear. Then you can look at something we call the unexplained variation. That is the amount of variation you don't explain even with a four factor model that gives us time series. Now, these time series we're seeing are interesting. So, if you look at these, uh, how important these complex higher order factors are relative to a simple slope factor, it varies over time. And it seems like to spike every time before bad times happen. But we show there's a correlation of 21% between change in our complexity measure and change in unemployment rates one year ahead. So if we show, I, if I show you the times of unemployment rates and our um, complexity measure, you can see very clear core movement that is shifted by around one year. So it seems to be predicted for future bad times when um, curves get more complex. Um, we also show that this complexity seems to be informative about some real economic conditions. Unemployment rate would be one example. Um, so coming back to um, changes over time, I can look at uh, the time periods where I have complex um, shapes. Uh, this would be the time series, um, I pick tessels. The time period where the most complex shape is tessel one, tessel two is the second tessel for my complexity measure, and tessel three is the last one. And I can look at the sharp ratios of my four factors for these different time periods. I want to clarify, there's a mechanical relationship that the variance of factor one is more important when you're in a shape when factor one is relatively more important. The variance of factor four is more important in the shape in the time periods which require a higher loading on factor four. That's mechanical. The effects on the mean and the sharp ratio, that's not mechanical. What we think is really interesting is a sign change. In time periods when you have simple term structures, that is when simple slope factor is a high sharp ratio. In complex time periods, you lose money with a simple slope factor. It actually gets a negative sharp ratio. Our complexity factor has a high sharp ratio. That means a positive time mean during time periods when you have a complex shape. During simple time periods, which coincide more with good time periods, you are not making money with our cost factor. Are these factors orthogonal? They are also in a very specific set. They're not uncorrelated from the, they're very weakly correlated. There is an uncorrelatedness in the basis function space, but once you project a return, this doesn't require complete orthogonality. There's a different um, orthogonality. They're not highly. They're weakly correlated, but not completely uncorrelated. Now, the very last thing for the last few minutes. So, in some sense, coming back to our discussion mm -hmm. earlier, um, if they were completely uncoordinated, mm -hmm. look at the different sharp ratios yeah. of the SDF yeah. and really look at the yeah. contribution of each factor separately, right? And mm -hmm. then add them up essentially. Yeah. But they are not exactly, that's why it's, it, we could orthogonalize the time series again, but then the no, 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 I think, this, would get I think this is fine. It's just in terms of the role of the factors in the SDF. Yeah. Very last thing. Um, I haven't shown you a very plain vanilla standard panel asset pricing analysis. What I just want to do here is the same thing that you've seen in many papers, like what the French 93 paper included. We create test assets, which will be 10 discount bonds, one year, two years, up to 10 year maturity. We use our full model to create them, but we also use um, the Nelson Svensson seed of the GSW discount bonds. So we have these test assets. Then we use different factors, OKR factors, PCA factors, from our French factors. We run time series regression, we look at ALPAs. Very plain vanilla. I do it in sample and out of sample. Uh, just to summarize the main findings, many returns with our four factors are very well explained. If you create this component with GSW, they're easier to price. Actually, two factors already do the job because there's less structure in there. Our four factors price GSW, PCAs from GSW will never price our discount bonds because they already put different structure into the data. Equity factors do not price term structure because they're essentially uncorrelated. If you yeah. construct it from our French factors from the bond returns. How? So one would be, let's say there are the first one. So the first is a mean. That one is let's say long, high minus low, and then you think about maybe curvature. So just so that it's kind of what we do here, right? Implicitly. Ad hoc. So yeah. if you just look at ad hoc 
yeah. methods. So yeah. to construct these, these factors that you do in an ad hoc way without the estimation, how close can you get? Quickly have to log into that. Um, I mean, the point that we wanted to make, if I look at the root mean squared errors, um, the average alphas, once this in sample is out of sample, once I have four factors, that is when the alphas really go down. And that's what we would have expected from the curves that I've shown before. Here, just show if you run in standard time series regression, you get the same result, which is what you would expect because if our betas are the same as time series betas, you should get this here, right? You only include the first and fourth factor? We haven't done the big, we should look into that. Um, in terms of when does it matter, I can just show you for the 10 discount bonds. But use two or three factors, you see clear mispricing, but this four is very low. So it seems like we long and would be mispriced if you don't include the more complex shapes, which was kind of somewhat in line if you remember the mean return plots, if there was some difference in the long end. So let me wrap up. So this has two contributions. One is methods. You can use a new method to estimate term structure factors. So it's unifying this curve fitting with a factor model setup. So our solution is very simple to implement, right? It's a simple rich regression. And we say it provides a new perspective of how to think about the machine learning approach to a financial problem. And we have a very extensive set of empirical results. So we claim that the dimensionality of the treasure market is four. So essentially, you just need four portfolios that replicate the term structure market. Risk can be modeled by cash flows and is the same as time series covariances. We provide a rational why you get slope and curvature patterns. So that's related to smoothness as an underlying principle. Um, and we show that there seems to be, from an asset pricing perspective, it's important to have a force factor, which we discover that matters for risk premium and we label it the complexity premium. Um, so we hope that our data that we provide, which would be the full panel of discount bond returns and our factors, will be useful for other research. So we make it publicly available. So the code, the data you can use for your own work. We also have a uh, full um, yield curve estimates there uh, up to 30 years. And we regularly update our data sets. So it's more up to date than GSW and follow list, et cetera. So thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for all the comments. It's very helpful. Thank you. Because we want to submit the paper in like two weeks, so it's good to get all the feedback. Yeah. Or very soon, whatever it means. But we want to rewrite it now and submit it soon. Yeah.